our second series of How to Fix Democracy, we've been focusing on this complex, thorny, convoluted relationship between capitalism and democracy in and out of America. Uh, Anne-Marie Slaughter is uh, a very distinguished political scientist. She's taught for many years at Princeton University, and she's the CEO of New America, which is a think tank focusing on renewing the promise of America. So she's a good person to talk to, not only about the promise of American capitalism, but American democracy. Uh, Anne-Marie, welcome to How to Fix Democracy. What, um, what do you think of this relationship between democracy and capitalism? Where, how, how do we, an, how do we an, untangle it? <laughs> well, it's a pleasure uh, to be talking to you. Uh, I, I love big ideas and thorny subjects, and this is certainly both. You know, um, I think the, you have to start by saying capitalism and democracy are combined in many, many different ways. Americans traditionally have thought of themselves both as exceptional and and as trailblazers, you know, that, that our way of combining a, a relatively unregulated capitalism and a highly individualist democracy was the best way. Uh, and so you put us probably at one end of the spectrum uh, and some of the European countries at the other and the Scandinavian countries, probably a little bit in the middle because they have very flexible uh, systems. But I think it, you have to start from the premise that there is no one way that capitalism supports democracy or that democracy supports capitalism. Really, it, these are uh, two, a political system and an economic system uh, in the United States, I would say that uh, we have allowed capitalism to infect our political system in a way that, that means our democracy is really not working very well, if at all. But the broader point is that we, we the people, preferably all the people, which has never really happened in the United States, uh, have the ability to reshape our democracy and to decide what kind of capitalist rules or socialist rules or some mix uh, we want to live in. Uh, and they, those two things can be separated and they can each be reformed in ways that reinforce better things in one another. Uh, I'm uh, both amused and slightly chilled with your choice of language, Anne-Marie. You suggest that capitalism or capitalism in America has effect infected American democracy, infection in the age of the coronavirus. Um, before I ask you what you mean by that, perhaps you, we, we might define our terms. We try to do that in this series because these are such slippery terms. In your mind, what does capitalism mean? Uh, well, <laughs> I think it is wise to define terms. I'm, I'm not using a terribly precise definition. It is effectively, in my view, a, an economic system uh, that privileges uh, the individual ability to accumulate uh, and spend wealth, wealth being capital, uh, and that assumes that if we allow individuals to build wealth, uh, that will be good for the prosperity of the society as a whole. Uh, and it, it includes a belief in relatively free markets. There's really no such thing as a completely free natural market. Markets are constructed, they're constructed by laws. Uh, you can decide uh, you know, what, what the playing field looks like and every capitalist system has those laws uh, and to create markets and also to, to regulate them in various ways. But overall, we do believe in a market economy in other words, that the value of individuals deciding 
what and how to exchange with one another is a far better system than say the state planning what needs to be made and, and what needs to be uh, exchanged. Since you're on a definitional role, uh, Anne-Marie, have a shot at democracy too. What does that mean in your mind at least? So democracy is the government, uh, I, I think, of, by, and for the people. That will, will do for me. The, the question then, of course, is, is it representative democracy? And in a country the size of the United States, uh, you have to be represented by others uh, to uh, have a government uh, of the people. We can't, we can't have direct democracy where we all vote on everything. Uh, but a democracy is a government by the demos, uh, the people. Uh, the, I think what we strive for in the United States is not just democracy, it's liberal democracy. And liberal democracy means rule of the majority, but protection of the minorities. Uh, so you have a, uh, yes, government by the people, but bounded by a whole set of rights uh, and those rights are not only aimed at protection of minorities. If you think of the First Amendment, for instance, we all have the right for freedom of speech, but it, there's a particular emphasis on certain inalienable rights or rights that must be protected so that the majority cannot take away the liberty, that's the liberal part of it, uh, of the minority. Liberty broadly understood. Let's go back then to this idea of infection. Uh, you suggested earlier that uh, American capitalism was infecting American democracy. What does that mean? Does that mean that American democracy is somehow mimicking, reflecting, mirroring uh, American capitalism? I, I'm not sure mirroring is the right word, and, and you're right, I, 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 it's got to be subconscious that I used infection in a moment of a pandemic. But what I meant was simply that our democracy is deeply, deeply corrupted uh, by big money. Uh, and so time after time, you can see that a majority of Americans want uh, sensible gun safety just to get, take one example, uh, or a, a, a the majority of Americans want action uh, to protect the climate, uh, to take another. There, there's more, there are all these areas where if you take a poll, you get somewhere between 55 and 70% of Americans in support of what seem like pretty sensible measures, and they cannot get through because Congress depends on being reelected. And because we have no controls on money in politics, or very few, uh, particularly on soft money, they are really captured. And this is true for Democrats as well as Republicans uh, by big money. Uh, one of my colleagues, Lee Drutman, wrote a book called The Business of America is Lobbying. Uh, and when you look at the power of lobby groups funded by corporate money. So that's the intersection with capitalism. You really feel that our democracy is broken. So I said infected by capitalism. I really I meant in the sense that they're, they're in between the, the money, big money, big power, the power of the corporate power. Uh, and also of, again, it's not just corporations. If you look at something like the IRA, and I'm sure if I were uh, on the on the right, I might say the ACLU, you know, that they have a, a disproportionate impact on what actually gets through in a way that makes many of us really feel unrepresented. And Marie, you have a, a very global perspective. You were educated in part at Oxford. You you've taught all over the world. Uh, your your academic focus has always been on international relations. Is this American version of, of democracy, is it replicated around the world or uh, do we find a different kind of democracy in Europe, particularly in Northern Europe? Well, it's, uh, yes, the, 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 I think European democracy is much more representative because almost all of it is based on some system of proportional representation. Right. The United States has first passed the post, which is deeply distorting because it means that, I mean, that's how, 
how you know you can you can get a minority of the votes but you get more than the other person and you win everything as opposed to a system which we we could have without changing the constitution we could do it simply by changing our electoral rules where you are represented in different percentages so for instance you could have ranked choice voting which means you choose your first uh, favorite candidate, your second, your third, your fourth, and through a system of accumulating votes, you would then allow different groups to be represented much more, more proportionally. So instead of just having two parties and the one that gets the more most votes, even if that's still a, a minority of, of, of the people uh, winning everything, you would actually have to keep appealing to people until you could get a majority of the votes. But how does that fix the problem that you talked about earlier of, 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 of money and corporate interest infecting democracy? Whether or not you have a multi-party system in the United States, you still have the, uh, the NRA, you still have the ACLU. Uh, again, I keep on using this term in our coronavirus age, in, in, infecting the political process. So how does multi-party do. politics address that problem? Well, so yes, look, there are, there are many, di many different issues. I mean, there's voter suppression, right? Voting rights issues, there's money in politics issues, uh, and then this is structural reform. Uh, and so one does not necessarily fix the other, although it, the, uh, we used to have essentially a four-party system. In the 1950s, 1960s, you had conservative Republicans and liberal Republicans and conservative Democrats uh, and liberal Democrats and conservative Democrats and liberal Republicans were kind of the same. A New England Republican uh, and, a, and a liberal Virginia Democrat were, were really the same. And so there was an ability to uh, compromise in ways that could get much more done. Uh, and one argument is if you, had the, if you had that kind of representation, you could once again find the votes in Congress necessary to pass really good campaign, uh, money and finance or campaign finance reform. But take them as separate. What I'm, the, I think those of us who support ranked choice voting support it because right now we have two parties that are completely not overlapping. And so it really is just a seesaw. They're not coming together. They're just waiting for their turn in power. Uh, and both of them are vulnerable to being primaried from the extremes. So they get more and more extreme, which means you've got a, you know, a Congress that is sort of out here where the majority of Americans are in between them. Uh, so ranked choice voting allows you to have third parties, fourth parties without being a spoiler. And it also compels candidates to reach out to more than just their base, which would then create a more representative Congress. And many of us feel like, well, that at least would get things, would, you'd be able to get more things done. I still think independently, I would be all for public financing of elections. I've often said if I lived in Britain where you have publicly financed elections and they're six week campaigns, I would have run for office long ago. But here, you know, that's just, you're going to spend two years calling people for money nonstop and then you're beholden to those people uh, the minute you get into office. And of course, if you're uh, in the House of Representatives, it starts all over again right away. In the Senate, you have a little bit more time. Given the way in which capitalism seems to be uh, upsetting or undermining democracy in America, in your view, how much um, focus do we need to pay on restructuring the very nature of American capitalism, which is creating so much inequality and particularly in the coronavirus age seems to be compounding that inequality? between rich and poor, between whites and blacks, between men and women? Yeah, uh, so I think we need fundamental structural economic, social and political reform. For me, we are where we were in roughly 1905. If you look at the transformation of, the, of, of really every part of American politics, the economy, and society, except for, and it's a huge except, race, which I'll come back to, 
you went from a laissez-faire 19th century system to a, a effectively social democratic safety net or foundation put in place that starts with the deep progressive reforms of uh, first Teddy Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, Taft, and then of course completed in the New Deal. But we overhauled our politics. We went from electing senators by the, the uh, senior legislative house of the states to direct elections. We moved away from conventions to primaries. We allowed women to vote. There were huge changes uh, there. We created what was the 20th century economy. In, in 1916, we passed an, a national income tax. We had competition policy, all the trust busting. And then we put in place all the, the, the infrastructure of health and safety regulation. So before that, you know, the late 19th century is a period of violence. It's a period of uh, real, I mean, cowboy capitalism, right? With no protections for workers. You, you had 16 hour days, right? And you go to eight hour days. We are, we are in that phase again, where we really have to remake the foundation of our economy and our society. And part of that is changing our politics. Again, the, these are, these are, uh, interconnected, but and a lot of this is just driven by tremendous technological disruption, as indeed uh, the last re remaking was. But I, where I would start, I mean, you you need you don't just need a safety net; you need a social foundation. You health healthcare is a universal right. Education, higher education, is a universal right that's affordable. Right, and then a, a long-term pension system that is no longer connected uh, to to jobs. I mean, healthcare uh, and uh, decent retirement are now connected to jobs, and there are fewer and fewer and fewer jobs that provide that, leaving more and more people behind. Is th are there indigenous traditions in American politics, in democracy, or in economic organization that Americans need to draw on? so that America doesn't just try to replicate Denmark or Germany or Sweden. Can this uh, attempt to reform, radically reform, fundamentally restructure capitalism, um, can it be done in a, in, a, in a uniquely American way? That is a great question because we are not Denmark and indeed I'm half Belgian, we are not Belgium. <laughs> for good or for ill. Uh, and I am keenly aware of, of American differences and I embrace uh, many of them. But and I would start again by saying, look, the transformation we made last time was bipartisan, right? There were Republican progressives and Democratic pro progressives. They, these were people who believed in good government, in government that delivered. And there again, I think there's a lot more room across a again, distorted political spectrum uh, right now. So I don't think it has to be partisan, but, or it can be partisan, but there's a lot of, of, of agreement. And again, I think we need, we're, we're seeing partisan realignment in various ways, but the part that we need to draw on is much more ground up. And I would say, even if you compare the new deal, the new deal was heavily top down. Um, that can't happen this time round, even if Washington worked, which it doesn't, because you you really do need, and this was very much American, what, lab, what, what Brandeis called in 1918, the laboratories of democracy. That's even more true now. You are seeing cities and states, communities, sometimes cities and counties together, regions experimenting with lots of different approaches to how you tackle education, to how you tackle labor power, to how you rebuild infrastructure. Uh, and frankly, we also need to rebuild trust and we need to be far more inclusive. That's got to come uh, from, from the ground up. You know, again, in the, in the 60s, it was the federal government intervening uh, against certain very recalcitrant states. And obviously you sometimes, you still do need the federal government. But as I look across the country, I see things like in Richmond, Virginia, Richmond, Virginia, the capital of the Confederacy, adopting a community wealth building approach. 
I see uh, uh, many of the Southern cities, which have, of course, they still have lots of racial issues, but they also have much larger populations of color. And they often ha have experimented with ways of supporting business in their communities in tying community colleges and local universities uh, to the needs of what business uh, wants in thinking about their environment and their local ecosystem uh, much more intensively. That's very American. Lots of experimentation, lots of innovation, and a, and a much more federalist approach. The word, you know, federalism for us has <laughs> has meant many different things. Uh, it, it, you know, Hamiltonian federalism means the federal government, but uh, and and Jefferson was an anti-federalist. But in the 20th century, federalists, as you know from the Federalist Society, was on the right. I think that ability to have an overarching frame and a tremendous amount of local experimentation uh, is something that it's not only American, but it's probably more deeply American uh, than it is uh, certainly any place in Europe. Uh, let's end on American responsibility in the world. You're, as I said earlier, you're yeah. Your career is very much built on your 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 academic expertise in international relations and America's role in the world. How important is it for democratic movements around the world and for the democratic project globally outside America? How important is it not only for America to fix its democratic crisis, its democratic deficit, but also to once again inspire the rest of the world to leave this uh, isolationist movement that we found ourselves in and once again embrace the world? Well, I think what what is is vital is that America can show as an alternative to China or to other countries that in fact, liberal democracy can deliver. It can deliver racial equality. It can deliver prosperity. It can deliver environmental sustainability. Uh, and it can deliver enough social cohesion to be able to govern itself. Uh, so that's a different kind of leadership. That's what Thomas Jefferson called, uh, you know, the ball of liberty will roll around the world. He did not think we should be out there leading by getting involved in others' affairs. He thought we should just, you know, tend our own garden and we would inspire others. And, and Barack Obama said in his inaugural address, we should lead uh, by the power of our example, not the example of our power. I, I do think we have a critically important role to play at global tables, but I don't think it can be leadership in the way we led in the 20th century, neither by using force as much as we did, nor even by being, you know, as Madeleine Albright said, the indispensable nation. Uh, I left, well, I didn't leave foreign affairs, but I had been in the State Department under Hillary Clinton for two years. And then in two, 2013, I went to New America because I concluded unless we fix our democracy, our educational system, our infrastructure, our health care, you know, our, our, our ability to ensure that all Americans prosper in a variety of ways, we have no business trying to lead the world. We can't lead the world just with troops. We do need to lead the world by example, by, by proving that there is a way consistent with democratic values, with liberal democratic values. And yes, I would say with a free economy, a, a supported one, but a free economy that really can uh, deliver for people. And then I think we inspire because the America of the 21st century will reflect the world. Right? We will not be a white majority with minorities. We will be a country that truly reflects the world. And that, I think, is deeply inspirational if we can deliver.